All right, the Bible says here in, uh, I'm sorry, let me turn there actually. Psalms chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. All right, now that's the verse we commonly use to say God doesn't believe in atheists. God does not believe in atheists. All right, atheists don't believe in God. Well, guess what? He doesn't believe in them either. Um, but the Bible says that a fool has said in his heart that there is no God. There's a reason you must know that is because when you're going to witness to an atheist, the first thing you need to realize is that they're fools. They're fools. They might sound smart. They might sound like they know a lot of big words. They can, they can weave words and sentences together. They can cite scientific resources and journals. They can cite uh, credible, and I mean that with air quotations, credible uh, scientists and men that have uh, devoted their lives to a lie, but they're fools according to the scripture. And you must remember that before you go any further with witnessing to an atheist, an atheist. Turn with me, if you will, to Romans chapter one, Romans chapter one. The Bible says here in verse 21, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish heart was darkened. Verse 22, be professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and to four-footed beasts and to creeping things. Verse 24, wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. All right, one more passage and then we'll begin the lesson. First Peter chapter three, verse 21. First Peter chapter three, verse 21. The Bible says here, the Bible says here in first Peter three twenty one. by the way, I wrote these on the board. You can always refer back to them. You can write them down, highlight them, whatever you want. First Peter chapter three, verse 21. The Bible tells us, I'm sorry. Maybe it's 2 Peter 3.21. Trying to find the verse that says to give every man a reason of the hope you have inside. Oh, it doesn't. Oh. You know what? I need to find that verse. I need to find that verse. It says, uh, one second. Yeah, way to throw them off. Way to throw off my groove. One second. This is an important verse. Um, of the hope. I thought it was in First Peter. I think it's every man a reason. One moment, everyone. Oh, it's three fifteen. Three fifteen. My bad. Wait, wait, hold up. What am I doing? First Peter 3.15. Yep. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, no. That's funny. Yeah. We're going to have to cut this out. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's, it goes like uh, to give every man a reason of the hope you have inside of you. Sanctify conscience. Give every... Oh, yeah, that was it. That was it right there. Okay, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh your reason of the hope that is in, with, uh, that is in you with meekness and fear. That's why I lost it because I was reading the first half, not the second half. Uh, now, the Bible tells us to have a reason, to ha or ha uh, give every man a reason of the hope you have inside of you. You need to be able to tell any person that has a qualm or has a complaint with your God, your Savior, you need to have a reason, an answer for them. And if you don't have an answer for why you believe in God, for why you believe in the Bible, and why you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, guess what? You're going to be ineffective when it comes to witnessing to atheists. You're going to be ineffective when it comes to witnessing to a, uh, a heathen God rejecter. So we need to have a reason, okay? And that means studying. That means studying. So... <clears throat> This lesson was brought on because we're going to have some members that are leaving and they might they want to witness the family members that are lost, that are unsaved, that are atheists. And I'm sure many of you have atheists in your family. 
Many of you have atheists in your family. And the most important thing when we witness to a lost atheist, I mean, all, most atheists are lost. I mean, that's what makes them atheists. There are some people that are saved that they, they, they start to reject God, but that's a different subject. What I'm talking about is a lost atheist that is, does not believe in God for a scientific reason. And we're going to talk about the two kinds of atheists, because really you can boil them down into two kinds. All right. There is an honest atheist. And there is a dishonest atheist. Dishonest. Okay. So, what do I mean? Well, one second. So, when we're dealing with an honest atheist, an honest atheist, uh, he might just have a moral issue or an I he might have an intellectual ignorance of, of God. And it, it, it would be... Something along the lines of uh, a mind or a head problem. Let me write that down. Okay? Uh, he has a head problem about believing in God. A head problem. All right? As opposed to a dishonest atheist, he doesn't have a head problem believing God. All right? He's intellectual enough. He might understand the Bible. But he doesn't have a head problem. He has a heart problem. A heart problem. Okay? This is a kind of atheist that has a moral qualm with why would God let a, why would God let the righteous suffer? Or why would God let a, send a person to hell? See, he has a heart problem with God. He doesn't want to believe in uh, uh, that God would send someone to hell. So because of that, instead of asking why, he's just concluded in his heart, well, there is no God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Okay? An honest atheist is more of a is sincere sincere okay what do you mean by that when you give them reasoning solid reasoning for why you believe in god instead of just scoffing they're going oh that makes that makes sense now see it's, it's a head problem with them they can't reason in their own minds why god is real so they just conclude that there is no god but once you can give them a reason of the hope you have inside of you they're sincere in receiving that because it's logical because it makes sense see Whereas a dishonest atheist, it's not a matter of, you could tell them the whole truth and explain to them and give them the most sound and solid reasoning you could ever bring forth. And they would be insincere in receiving it. They would, they would have a, head, a heart problem with it. So they would reject it, not because it's uh, false, but because it's true. See, they're dishonest. All right, and uh, an honest atheist is more in line with a agnostic agnostic okay an agnostic simply is open to the idea of there being a god see they're more in line with being an agnostic whereas an atheist is hardcore he 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 is an utter god rejecter okay he completely rejects god okay now one of these is easier to witness to because all you need to know is some sound logical biblical reasoning for why you believe in God. Okay? They're easier to witness to. Oh. Whereas a dishonest atheist, it doesn't matter how much you tell them, they're going to be like an ostrich with their head in the sand. They're going to be difficult. Difficult. Okay? Not because you don't know the answer, but because they won't take the answer. They'll do things like move goalposts. They'll do things like ignore the your sound reasoning and they'll do they'll bring something else to the forefront rather than address what you've already explained to them see as soon as you give them one reason they're just on to a different reason why they won't believe see one of these guys they'll ask questions to get answers the other one will ask questions to get more questions see well what about this or what about this or what about this whereas a sincere person once they get an answer they'll be like oh okay and that's it that's, that's the end of their intellectual understanding. See, because they had their, an their question answered. So before you're going to talk to an atheist, you need to figure out which one you're dealing with. Which one you're dealing with. Because there's two kinds of atheists. And there's going to be two different ways you might want to approach them. You see, uh, when you're approaching an honest skeptic, you really only need to have the facts. When you're approaching a dishonest you're, you're, you're not going to win them over in one day. That's just not how it's going to work. 
when you're witnessing to a dishonest atheist, you need to, it's going to, you're going to be more of a witness against them. See? So, as I'm going to explain this, I want to also show you, uh, the fact is this. These are two kinds of atheists, right? But you need to realize that what they believe, they want to say it's scientific. They want to say it's factual. They want to say that we, as Christians, it's just a bunch of mysticism or, or, or uh, uh, it's just a bunch of hocus pocus or fairy tale. Uh, and they get very uh, rude. You know, these guys, they're, they're going to be more, uh, uh, what's the word? They're going to be less aggressive. These kinds of atheists are going to be very rude and very aggressive and brash in their beliefs. But you know how I just said they ha they're brash in their beliefs? Because atheism is not scientific. Atheism is a religion of faith, beyond a shadow of a doubt. So what you're going to do when you're trying to witness this to atheists is you don't have to prove the existence of God to them. You don't. All you have to prove is that their beliefs take more faith than our beliefs. You see? Because atheists want to say, we, we have religion, they have science. But the fact is, their belief system takes more faith than our belief system. You see? The Bible says in, uh, I think, 2 Timothy, to beware of sciences falsely so-called. Okay? So, it's not science versus uh, Christianity. That's not the dilemma here. It's really, uh, you can take a picture of that right now. Okay? It's not science versus religion. It's religion versus religion. You see? Atheism takes more faith than Christianity. That's just a plain fact. So we're going to go over a little bit on, on which one actually takes more faith is in, and is more sound and reasonable to believe. And when we go over these, remember that when you're going to talk to an atheist, they're going to have some arguments against your faith. And this, we're going to try and ex examine and explain which one is actually more reasonable. Now, the first thing is first. They say our, our religion takes faith. But they, on the other hand, believe they don't need faith. Well, I hope by the time we're done, it's going to be clear that they need more faith than we do to believe in the lie of evolution and atheistic moral relativism. So the first thing I want to examine is the ethos behind both groups, okay? The ethos. All right, Christianity, we believe that Jesus Christ died for our sins, was born, uh, was buried, and then rose again the third day. And now, by believing on him, we have everlasting life, okay? Atheists, they believe, and their, their religion teaches that the way things are given life is things die and die and die, and, and things get better and better and better because of it. See, theirs is a religion of death, a religion of death. See? And the evidence for, for atheism as opposed to Christianity is it's way, way, wor it's way down here. Whereas the evidence for Christianity is way up here. Um, we have so many different ways of looking at the proof of what the Bible says about God. See? We have the Bible itself. Okay? I've told you this before, the Bible is 66 books written over the span of 1,500 years, written over three different continents by, over, by about 40 different authors with varying different uh, backgrounds and walks of life. Some, are, some were kings, some were farmers, some were uh, prisoners. Some, uh, the, and somehow this book was composed in such a way over such a long period of time where there is virtually no proven error or contradiction. There is no proven error or contradiction. You can't name one book on the face of the earth that is like this book. You can't. And you, can't, you don't even need to just look at the Bible. See, there's so much proof for what the Bible says uh, in, this, in the world. You can look at geography. Uh, I mean, let me show you a book. I suggest every Christian get their hands on this book. If you would like to buy a book, we have them upstairs for sale for five, five bucks each. Five bucks each. I was going to give the brother that one, but uh, just so we can get more, uh, this one's very cheap. Very cheap. The Evolution Handbook. The Evolution Handbook. And this one is going to show you all the, all the reasons why evolution is false. See? It's, a, it's, it's very thick. You're not going to go through it all. But it is, it is 
so helpful just so you can at least understand why is the Big Bang Theory false? Why is evolution false? What about the geogra uh, geologic column? See? But there is indisputable evidence for the flood account. See, Noah's flood is factual. See, the Bible speaks on these things factually. It's not just some sort of uh, old myth or legend. These things are written as a matter of fact, like you would just say, you know, uh, you would just talk in day-to-day -day life. Like, oh yeah, the flood happened. God just takes it for granted. I mean, let me, let me, let me give you a reason. What, how, come there, how come people find seashells on mountaintops? How, how does that logically, reasonably happen? How can you find that? Have you ever just been driving? Maybe you, did you take the 15 down here? No? If you ever take the 15 or you take the, um, the 8, if you take the 8, you'll notice once you start passing El Cajon, you start to see all the rocks on the mountains. And how do the rocks get here or get there? Oh, they must have evolved that way. <laughs> no. Uh, maybe like a flood. Maybe a flood happened. Okay? I mean, you can go uh, genetically. Genetically. Yes, brother. Oh, how come they're all round? That's another good point. <laughs> yeah. Uh, genetically, you have scientific proof. I mean, listen, it's a scientific fact that, science, uh, that, that we can trace our genetics back to three pairs of men and women. Three pairs. All right? And the Bible says their names were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Is, how is that possible? That the Bible could be so accurate. You know, you could go read the book of Job and you have so many different accounts of, of scientific facts that they, the writer of the book of Job could have, couldn't have had any proof, any scientific reasoning for believing. See, let me give you, let me help you so you can read it easier. Um, <clears throat> the fact is that we have more proof. I mean, historical, the, the Bible is, is historically accurate as well. Uh, not only that, but prophetically, prophetically, the Bible talks about uh, Alexander the Great before he was ever even born. Did you know that? Do you know the Bible actually spoke about, about crucifixion as a torture, as a method of torture before it even was invented? Ah, yes, brother. Current events too, like the Euphrates River drying up. Oh, yeah. You watched that video I sent you? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the, you know the Euphrates River is drying up right now, and the book of Revelation says that there's four angels buried under that river. And you know something funny is uh, geologists actually uh, put some recording equipment down in the caves of that river, because when the, when the river subsided, caves were revealed that were underneath, and they heard the sound of groans and, and, and moaning deep in those caves. It's the four angels. The Euphrates River. Must just be a coincidence, right? See, so I said the Euphrates River. Oh, the Lord's going to, uh, they're uh, fallen angels. So what does, that, what does uh, uh, atheism have for evidence? Some bones? Some bones? Some, thing that, some things they found in the dirt? The geographic column or the geologic column? You see, their evidence is not concrete, you see, because if you want to debunk a atheism, all you really need to do is attack evolution. Because that's their big selling point, is evolution. See? And the proof for evolution is, is, is pathetic. It's sad, really, how bad it is. Well, what do you mean? Aren't, the, aren't those bones proof of evolution? Okay. How do you know those bones ever had children? All right? I just debunked evolution right there. You'd have no proof that those bones they have ever had any offspring that lived. See? Okay, so you, you can't... Any bone you find in nature is not proof of anything. See? But here, further, uh, for, uh, furthermore, those bones... You know how they date those bones? See? There's several different methods of dating bones. See? Fossils. And the, the most solid one they have, the most... The, their, their, their biggest hit, you see, when you go... Uh, when, when evolution is going up to Christianity, he says, all right, you give me your best hit and I give you my best hit. Their best hit is C14 dating. That's their strongest hit. And C14 14 dating is, is called radiometric dating. See? And what it does is it measures the amount of carbon that these bones absorb in their lifespan. And once it dies, it doesn't absorb any more carbon from the atmosphere. See? When the sun is hitting down, it's, it's hitting carbon into our system. 
And once you die, you don't absorb anymore. So what it does is radiometric dating, it takes the amount of carbon that is in those bones and it can guesstimate how much, uh, how old that bone was uh, when it started to fossilize. See, the problem with that though, is it's not as foolproof as they want to say. Because in order for them to get an accurate measurement of those fossils, it needs to be under perfect circumstances, under a perfect environment. For example, if, there was, uh, if it was raining nonstop and, and, and things were eroding and things were uh, constantly uh, uh, hitting these fossils, it would not have accurate dating. See, if there is, for example, a flood, a worldwide flood maybe, those bones would be, none of them would be, would, would be proof of anything. Not only that, but if you actually take it further, if you look at their, at their evidence, you find that what they're guilty of doing is that they'll take some fossils and they'll say, oh, look, this one says it's 72 million years old. Okay, first and foremost, once it reaches a certain threshold, I forget how, like tens of thousands of years, they, they have no idea how old those bones can be. See? But you don't even have to go to that route. Um, their own admission, they take bones and on one bone... Say you have a mammoth, right? One part of the mammoth, say the tail, it says it's 16,000 years old. But one part of the mammoth, say the, 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 the nose or the, the trunk, the trunk, what is it, what's it called? A, a tusk. They'll say it's, it's a million years old. The same bone has different dates. How can you take that as any, any evidence? And guess what? Not only do they do that, but they'll, they'll willingly throw out evidence that goes against their belief. See, well, what they're doing is they're trying to find bones that will prove evolution. So what they'll do is they'll throw out bones that don't prove evolution. Does that sound scientific to you? No. By the way, this is all in here. If you, uh, you have it available to you. So we have so much evidence and their evidence is so weak. Their evidence is so weak. See, evolution, you can also just explain it to them. Uh, there are several different kinds of evolution. I believe there's six kinds. So when you want to talk to an atheist about evolution, they're going to say, well, evolution is real. Really? Okay. Which, which, which form of evolution is real? Uh, most, most people that are professing atheists will log out after that. But the ones that actually know what they're talking about, well, uh, you know, they're going to say, well, uh, obviously evolution is real because we can observe animals changing over time, which is true but not the way they say it is. You see, if you, want to de if you want to defeat an evolutionist or an atheist in a debate, all you have to do is point out the fact that there's different kinds of evolution. And the only evolution that is actually scientifically uh, defensible is microevolution, meaning little dogs turn into big dogs over time or big dogs turn into little dogs, but we never see a, a big dog turn into an orangutan, amen? You never see that in nature, ever. Show me a monkey that's turning into a, a cat right now. You see, realistically, if evolution is true, we should see animals right now that are in the transition of becoming other forms of animals. How come you can't observe that in nature? See, because they want to say that because microevolution is true, that must mean macroevolution must be true, which is factually wrong. See, no, no Christian, Christians believe in evolution, sure. Microevolution. I believe that some, cat, some dogs over time can turn into different breeds of dogs. I don't, I don't have a problem with that. What I have a problem is when you say, when you say a, a dog is going to turn into a, a, a chimpanzee. So you can't, that, that's just not true. Okay, so their evolution is false. Or their evidence is, is bad. All right, next thing that they'll have is wh which, one, which group has a better st origin story? Okay, the origin of all creation to a Christian is God Almighty. All right, it, it, it must take a supremely powerful being to make all the atoms in the world, in the, in the universe. Whereas an atheist believes that, evolu uh, that our origin comes from the Big Bang Theory. What's that mean? That they believe the Big Bang Theory is something came from nothing. That's literally what they believe. See, something came from nothing. How is that scientific? Oh, something came from nothing, so it must be true. That, that's, that's a paradox. See, so 
when you're debating with an atheist, when you're debating with an atheist, you want to make sure, like, okay, so where do you think everything came from? Oh, uh, from the Big Bang. Well, what happened before the Big Bang? Nothing. So how did some? How did how did we get everything from nothing then? And they'll have they might have some explanation. Well, the the, the plasma and the and the thing. And really, all it comes down to is this. When they want to tell you where everything came from, they're eventually going to have to admit nothing, which is a factual. It's just factually wrong. See, so when you're dealing with an atheist that's that's hardened in their heart, a, a dishonest atheist, you need to be aware of the fact that they're going to have big words. They're going to have long-winded explanations. You don't need to be intimidated by that. You don't have to know what all their terminology means. You don't have to know what all their big, long-winded sentences are saying. All you have to really know is what they're saying is matter and energy. What do you mean? When you ask an atheist where everything came from, they have to say nothing at some point. And that's when you got them. Because that's, that's impossible. Okay, that's just a plain fact. So when they say the plasma, okay, plasma is something, right? Okay, well, but the clouds, then they formed in the universal clouds. Well, okay, well, those, are, those are matter. That's matter. The law of, uh, uh, the law of matter is that nothing, some, something can't be created or destroyed. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. See? So they have to admit at some point that everything that we see in our life had to have come from a supernatural cause. Supernatural. And that's when you got them. See? You don't have to know their whole terminology. Just know that, listen, it's matter and energy. You're telling me that something came from nothing and that's impossible. See, that's not scientific. Okay? Um, why? Listen, th if you're going to take anything from the le this lesson when you're debating an atheist or you're trying to witness to an atheist, all you have to know is the second law of thermodynamics. Okay? The second law of thermodynamics. This is what Einstein said. Okay? Atheists look at Einstein with, with, uh, with reverence, don't they? Don't they idolize him? Well, let's take Einstein's view and, put, and, and uh, put it against atheism. Einstein said this about the, uh, his view was this, that thermodynamics is the only physical theory of universal content concerning which I am convinced that within the framework of the applicability of its basic concepts, it will never be overthrown. So basically, Einstein said he believes that of any law in nature, the one that will never be overthrown is the law of entropy. What's that mean? So thermodynamics uh, has to do with the law of entropy, meaning everything in life, it doesn't get better and better and better and better. It gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Okay? I mean, listen, if you're over the age of 30, you probably already know that's just true. All right, your back isn't getting better and better and better. Amen? Brother Lewis, is your neck getting better? Okay. See, because that's, that's just life. That's a fact. If you left a brand new uh, uh, 2024 Tesla Model S, yeah, <laughs> if you left it out for, for 100 years, would it get better and better and better and better? No. No. Okay? You don't get better over time. It gets worse. Well, evolution teaches that we're just gradually evolving, getting better, improving more and more, getting different sort, forms of uh, uh, ad adaptation. That's just not true. It gets worse. Yes, brother? They, they argue that with that, they argue that, that society gets better. Soci oh, yeah, they say that well, there's evolutionary, a societal evolution. Oh, you know, we're getting better. You know, communism is the way to go. I mean, isn't that, that's what evolutionists want to believe. See, and you can't tell me that this takes less faith than just believing that there is a God. It's just, it's, it doesn't make sense in your own brain. God gave you a brain. Amen. Why don't you use it? Amen. See, the problem with an evolutionist isn't his brain. It's his heart. It's his heart. See, we don't believe in, uh, an evolution doesn't believe in God, not because of, of the evidence, but because of his heart. Because in or, if, he, if he's to admit there is a God, he's, he has to admit that he's in subjection to that God. See, and they have a problem with authority, not with evidence. 
See, because the moment they have to admit that there is a higher authority, then they have to do what he says rather than what man says. That's the problem. See? So what about it? A Christian's view on the truth is that there is an objective final authority, final truth. My truth might be different than your truth, but if the Bible says that uh, I'm wrong, then guess what? I'm wrong. But an evolutionist believes that it is relative, that truth is relative, that the Bible is not true because I say so, because I'm my final authority. That's moral relativism. See, that's relativism. A Christian believes that we have an intelligent designer, okay? I like to use this illustration because uh, it, it really gets the point across. What is this? What is this? This is, this is a watch. Okay, you can say it's a smart watch. I, I don't think it's that smart. Okay, it can't beat me in a game of tic-tac-toe, but okay, it's a smart watch. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's just say you leave that out on the sidewalk. And then one, per one day some person walks past it and he looks at a, a, a watch on the ground and he says, Oh, look, a watch. It must have evolved. That's what an evolutionist believes. He can go out in nature and see all the majesty and splendor, the waterfalls, the clouds, the, 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 the water cycle, the nature, the ecosystem, and just look at it and say, wow, that's all just random. That's, there's no intelligence behind that. There's just nothing there. It just evolved like that. That's what an evolutionist believes. If you were to go out into the woods and you saw a painting of the Mona Lisa, do you think that nature just made that? Yeah, the ants must have made it. Wow. Or do you think there must have been someone that painted that? I mean, listen, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist. That's the key here. It doesn't take a brain surgeon to just assume by its creation that there must have been a creator. See, there has to be a cause of everything. There has to be a designer. You don't just go look at a Honda Civic and say, listen, uh, that, that just, that, that's just always been, you know. That's just evolved like that. The ocean over hundreds of thousands of years of eroding the sand, it just happened to form that Honda Civic and, uh, and the engine and the VTAC and all that stuff. And the, the mechanic gets it. <laughs> you, if you look at nature, if you see like the reproductive system of plants, mm -hmm. how they're not, they can't, some plants can't do it on their own. They need pollinators. So that just can just... Yeah, how could that happen? happen? You know, unless it all came into being at the same time. Unless Genesis 1 was true, I wonder why. See, there is an intelligent designer. And what these atheists are going to say is, look, no, no, that's not true. Because actually, uh, we all evolve from the same form. That's why different animals have the similar bone structure. Like whales have a similar anatomy in the pelvis as humans. And then monkeys have a similar, uh, similar G uh, DNA structure, almost like 96% or something as humans. So that proves that we came from a common ancestor. No, that proves we have a common designer. See, if you saw that Honda Civic and then you all of a sudden you looked at a Honda Accord and you saw all the similarities, they didn't evolve from sort of some sort of old ancient Honda. They had a similar designer, right? At least the mechanics think I'm funny. So <clears throat> we have proof by design. Listen, this takes more faith to believe this happened by chance than to just believe God made it. It takes more faith. All right, which one takes more faith? Uh, the, the idea of morality coming from God or from the winner? See, it's survival of the fittest with the evolutionist. See, the Bible says here in Romans chapter 1. Yes, sister. Okay. <clears throat> Romans 2, I mean. 2.16. 2, the Bible says in the day... I'm sorry, not 2.16. Two fourteen. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their what? In their hearts. Also, uh, uh, in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness and accusing or else excusing one another. See, an evolutionist or an atheist has no idea where our conscience comes from. See, an evolutionist or an atheist can't explain how we have morality. See, how do we judge what right or wrong is? Do we judge right or wrong by what Congress thinks? <laughs> I hope not. Do we judge right or wrong by what our president thinks? 
Do we judge right or wrong by, by what uh, school says? No. Listen, you don't have to go to school to know that f stealing is wrong. You don't have to go uh, to Congress to know that adultery is wrong. You have a conscience written in your heart that is God-given. And evolution can't explain it. See, it takes more faith to believe that we get our morality from uh, just chance, from just evolution, from the survival of the fittest. See, I mean, listen, if survival of the fittest is how we decide what morality is, then how come we know what, what Hitler did was wrong? See, because his whole uh, MO, his whole uh, method was survival of the fittest. See, how come we know instinctually in our hearts that that's wrong? Unless God gave us morality. All right, finally, the savior of these two religions. Our savior is a God who came down in the likeness of sinful flesh, who knew no sin, and he paid for our sins out of love. Their God is Darwin, Marx, and Freud. See, they have limited finite gods. They, ha they can't explain to you where, everything, where anything came from. They have very little proof. They have very little, little evidence. And they have a false system that denies Jesus Christ. The Bible says, wherefore, by their fruit, you shall know them. How come the fruit of our religion is good fruit? How come it leads to life? And how come the fruit of their religion is death, abortion, murder, uh, starvation, uh, world governments collapsing? How come their fruit always leads to this, where our fruit always leads to this? In, uh, better household. Since Jesus came into your house, into your lives, hasn't he made things better? Hasn't he made things uh, cleaner in your life and purer and he's given you peace? How come you can never find peace in this? You see? But it all goes down to who are you trying to witness to right now? See, a, a, a dishonest atheist, he's going to look at all this and he's still going to deny it. So what do you do at that point? You pray for them. You pray for them. And God, it's, it's going to have to be the one that deals with them. See, because salvation is a supernatural thing. See, and you can have all the reason, all the explanation, but you don't realize that the Holy Spirit has to convict this person. The Holy Spirit has to work in their lives. And, and it, it won't happen immediately a lot of the times. Sometimes it'll take time. But all you can do when you're witnessing to an atheist is know who you're dealing with. See, if you're going to deal with an honest person, you deal with them and you just explain to them simply and plainly with grace and, and, and meekness. And if they're really honest, they're going to come to the conclusion, okay, that makes more sense than what I believe. But if they're difficult, if they're rejecting God and they're insincere and they have a heart problem, all you can do is just be a witness against them and say, listen, the Bible said a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And after I've told you all these things and you still reject the fact that you think you have less faith than I do, you're deceived. You're a fool. It takes more faith to believe in atheism than it does to believe in Christianity. Amen? Amen. All right.